everyone, and welcome to the 50-Day Property Challenge brought to you by the EDPF Property Academy and Private Property. Today is day 10 of our journey, so it's time to wrap up the first two weeks with Matt Owl and Jared Ricketts by going over some of the highlights of the week. First up, we had TJ of M5 Property Addicts, who spoke with our celebrities about finding their best investment strategy. Let's listen to what TJ had to say. Boom, boom, welcome, welcome. Right. So I just want to jump into a presentation format. And within that presentation, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just going to walk you through. If you've got any questions, you can jot them down. I'll try to pause. Um, but today it's about walking through the different strategies, right? Look at myself around about six years ago, and I looked at if I was to start again, knowing the strategies that I do know now today with the things that I'm doing, this would I kind of like tell the next person that this is where you can start off from. So I've really looked at it from a perspective to say, you potentially know nothing about property and you potentially have done maybe two or three and you're looking at different strategies. And today, by the end of the session, I'm hoping that I would have given you what I call seven steps of getting started into the investment of property. And uh, having said that, I want to define what an investment is. An investment is something that you're going to do today and you're going to make money. So making money for me, it's from day one. And the reason why I say that is because when I started doing property investments, which was around about, I want to say doing property investments the right way. Because before that, I was doing it, but it wasn't the right way. I was not cash flowing. What do I mean by cash flowing? Money in your pocket. That's what it basically means, right? So you got an asset, you got a property. After all of your expenses, you are receiving profit. Profit, cash flow, the same thing. And we intertwine those two ways as we go along. Um, and everything that I'm going to teach you today, it's everything that I have done. Uh, so the beauty okay. about what I do is that yeah. um, I never talk about something else that I've read in a book and it's, in, it's inspirational for me. I, I, I always want to teach from a perspective of I've done this and I haven't done it once, but I've done it a couple of times. And with that, I then bring it mm. into, into, into my training programs. And then that way I can be extremely confident when I am teaching you because I've walked the journey. So love that. I, awesome. So so I've got a I've got a slide that I've put together that I'm just gonna go through. Um, but most importantly, I want to start off from a perspective of when an investment, uh, there is a reason why you're doing that. And the reason is that either you're wanting to create some side hustle money, so you're wanting to have some cash flow on the side, um, and I'm going to ask you. Uh, how much are you wanting actually to have as an income? So think about that. And the second part okay. of it is that um, people are generally wanting to create this future nest, right? Um, and that's a, a lot of people think that's where that's where an investment is all about. Now, having said that, I'm a student of Robert Kiyosaki. I gravitate to a lot of his uh, teachings. And, and Robert speaks of two things to say that when you start to doing an investment, number one, an investment gives you money. So, so you cannot be contributing to something to make it an investment. An investment is an asset. It has to give you money. How much money it is, it's what we're going to be talking about a little bit later, right? That's the first thing. Then the second thing is that an investment shouldn't be giving you money in the future, but it should give you money today because if you're having an investment today then it should act like an investment today not like a liability right so so with those two things in mind Gerard you've been here um, so I want to ask you what what is your ideal amount of money that you're saying hey TJ if I get 10 grand every month maybe in the next 50 days I'm good right on your first investment or maybe let's even push it a little bit harder for six months. Well, wow, what's, what's that money? And we'll call it cash flow. For sure. So I think for me, I mean, 
um, just listening to conversations with my friends who have rentals now. They've been getting seven and a half to eight to nine. I think that's the climate in some of the um, essential areas in Cape Town. So I'm, I'm hoping that in my, in my first investment, I could acquire a seven and a half and eight thousand rand just to start with, you know, just to just to accumulate some funds and and um, make sure that I'm cash flow positive because um, you know there are there are rates and levies and all those things included, and so um, I'm going to take it very steady and very safe. I think in the beginning, just get the one property working for me, accumulate some funds. Hopefully, um, if it's an access bond, we're able to accumulate some funds and then. Um, put down a deposit for the next property, um, you know, use it as equity, that kind of thing. So so that's where my brain is at. I could be okay. wrong. <laughs> no, not at all. That's your start, right? Um, and that's the beauty of it. It's your start. It's not mine. Um, yes. It's your start. It's your reality. So that's what you need to take in consideration. That's your truth and that's what you want to do. Uh, Met L, I think, welcome. And I just want to ask you the same question as well. Uh, you know, you're starting off in investment in property. So what is your your basic one-on-one cash flow, if you were to say in the next six months, is 10 grand, 20 grand, what's that figure looking like for you? Hi, everyone. Sorry, I'm a bit late. I just ran in. Um, so for me, I think a good, I think I'm also gr- rolling with, uh, with Jared on this one, I guess between 7.5 and 9. You know, uh, I'm also considering the, the the climate of rentals in central Pretoria area. So it'll also be based on whether I'm getting a two bedroom or a three. But that's pretty much the ballpark I'm going for. Not too high, not expecting too much, especially considering where we're at um, with our economy and stuff like that. So, yes, I also want to be cash flow positive. So it also depend on the price that I'm buying this property for. But I think if I can at least get in a rental of 7.5 towards 9, it would it would at least cover bond and hopefully a bit of the levies, you know, because you, like you say, you want when you buy, it must be an investment from the get-go, not start as a liability and then only later become an investment. Okay, cool. So, so my journey of property, when it started off, guys, um, I almost want to I, I get where you are right now. And that's cool. That's a good place to be in. Uh, some of you have started. Some of you haven't started. Uh, but the bottom line is that if you're thinking about it already to start or you have started maybe one or two, it's a good space because you already know that that's what you want to do. That's number one. Number two is that for the purposes of this class today, for me, an investment needs to give you money today. That was some amazing insights into property strategies. And I'm sure that we all learned a great deal from TJ's vast experience. Next up, we had Sophie of Nexia SAB and T, who taught us all about the due diligence process, what it is, and why we need to do a DD when we purchase our first property. Let's listen in. What is a due diligence? For all intents and purposes, a due diligence is doing your homework before actually acquiring the property. What are you in for? Ask yourself, do I actually want to get into this deal? Do I actually want to purchase a property that doesn't have the correct zoning? Do I want to purchase a property that currently has a tenant in place? And I'm not able to ask that tenant to vacate in line with that lease agreement. So those are the types of discussions and observations and things that you would need to think about during your due diligence process. And I think in closing, it's also important to remember the difference between a due diligence and uh, often how many people um, mistake a financial feasibility study as being the same process. And a financial feasibility is basically um, the sums. Does it make business sense for you to actually acquire that property? So in short, once you've gathered the information, how does that feed into your cash flow requirements and or your cost of purchasing your property? And then finally, as part of that financial uh, due diligence or financial feasibility study, 
does the investment return actually make sense for you to proceed with the acquisition of your first property? So let's get to the type of information that one would consider together when purchasing a property. So first and foremost, what is the intention of you purchasing that property? Would it be for residential purposes? Would it be an investment property which you um, plan on leasing out to a tenant? Um, because all of the uh, considerations will ultimately impact your final decision on whether you wish to proceed with the acquisition or not. At the onset, um, irrespective of the reason for your acquisition, there are certain costs which are mandatory and you won't get yourself out of before purchasing that property. So understand what costs would be involved in purchasing that property. For example, if you're applying for a bond, what are the bond registration costs to acquire that property? If it's a um, residential property and not subject to VAT, um, there would be a transfer duty applicable. And what funds do you need to come up with to ensure that you're able to meet that cash outflow at the onset of acquiring that property? There could also be other conversion costs. For example, the property may not be in a state for you to lease out um, because it needs repairs, it may need improvements. And understanding all of those types of costs and time delays may factor your financial due diligence to, um, to understand whether you wish to proceed with the acquisition of the property or not. The revenues, um, so um, does the actual property have a lease agreement in place? And or what does the market data show you that um, is a potential rental return in that specific area for the size of the property, the number of bedrooms, etc.? I think it's safe to say that um, no matter how beautiful the property is um, that you're purchasing, if the market data suggests that you're only able to achieve, for example, 5,000 Rand rental a month in that specific area, it's going to be very difficult for you to find a tenant willing to pay double that uh, rental for those uh, in that specific area. Staff. Um, interview staff or people in and around that are working on the property, they generally have a wealth of information on the area, the challenges in the area, and specifically to that property. What keeps the current landlord or owner up at night? Are there um, roof leaks? Are there security risks? Because if there are, for example, security risks, you may need to factor in additional security electric fencing, private security, etc. Gathering this information obviously allows you to, um, to document all the costs that may actually impact your future or your decision to purchase the property or not. Expenses. Um, so expenses can range from normal council expenses. You would ask for your, the municipal account this would indicate the current utilities that the tenants and or the owner of the property is paying um, from electricity, refuse, rates and taxes, etc. That municipal um, account is also an indicative uh, reflection of what the municipal valuation of that specific property is. Um, I think uh, also uh, other sources of information is uh, obtaining a copy of the title deed for that specific property. And why I suggest uh, getting the title deed, we've often found that when one purchases a property, there are some restrictive conditions um, embedded in the title deed for the owner of that property. It could be, for example, there are height restrictions, the um, the zoning of the specific property, the, the actual um, gross letable area, and how much are you actually able to 
develop on that specific land. And then finally, um, ensuring that the owner has a full disclosure on the patent and latent defects on that specific property before you purchase. Some critical information that we need to know when purchasing our first property. Let's take a breather and hear from our partner, Private Property, before we listen to Miguel talk about bond finance. Welcome back to the 50 Day Property Challenge, week two wrap up. So finally this week, we learned all about financing your first property purchase using a bond from the bank. Let's listen to Miguel from Absa Bank as he explains how the bank makes a decision on whether to grant you a loan or not. Nigel asked me to, to um, come on and really talk to you, to you guys about, about buying your first property and what's involved and kind of go from, from A to C, you know, so kind, kind of go from, from you know, so this is like kind of a bit of a, of a 101 in property finance. And um, I've got a couple slides that kind of guide the thinking and sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words. So, so really, this was actually a three-part series that we did for Nigel's uh, mentees. Um, and, and we're just going to cover like the, the, the first part today, you know, and we can, we can see where the conversation goes. But we, we, we're going to look at you know, how, uh, obtaining finance as a salaried individuals, I know you with, with yourselves, you're probably sitting the self-employed side. So, so we'll kind of break out into that as well. Uh, but looking at affordability, credit bureau, property valuation, and then, then how, you know, how to get a home loan if you are looking at investing. Okay. And we can definitely have, have that conversation if, you know, if, 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 if that's interesting to you, but that's right at the end, we'll just probably get through the, the basics if that's okay. Um, so maybe, maybe a, a comment around affordability. So let me spell volume up. Okay. So affordability. Um, so in about 2007, 2008, the national credit act, uh, came into being and really what that, what that does effectively in, in very simple terms is it, is it puts the onus on the bank to ensure that the, the person applying for the loan can sustainably afford the loan payments. So it's no longer, so the bank, not, so it's, it's, it's not just up to the person providing their own details. The bank also has to verify that the person is actually receiving that income, et cetera. And if they don't, the bank can be accused of reckless lending. Uh, where there's fines involved, they have to let the person off in terms of their loan obligations, etc. So the entire onus is on the bank to ensure that the applicant um, can afford the loan. There's some very specific um, structures in, in the NCA, in the, in the National Credit Act, in terms of what that looks like, what the banks must look for. But uh, it's, it's become a lot more stringent than it used to be. And I still get people telling me, you know, telling me who got a home loan 10 years, you know, sure, now what's it, 13, 14 years ago, pre-2008, you know, why is it so difficult to get a home loan? Well, you know, the bank needs to needs to conform with, with us. Um, when, the, when we look at affordability, um, the, the types of income that we look at are, are salaried income, uh, commission, self-employed, rental income, um, you know, in, in, in the case, if, if, if you're running your, your company through a, a PTY, um, you know, in terms of what that, what the PTY's income looks like. So, so, so all, all, all the normal um, kind of requirements in terms of what, what looks like, what looks like income. Um, and then off that, so then there's a calculation that it happens. And basically, uh, we, we take off your, you know, um, okay, if you're buying your first home, if you're paying rent, to obviously ignore that because you won't be paying that rent going forward. But we take off any um, car payments, store payments, credit card payments, um, Vodacom, MTN, Wi-Fi, you know, all those normal payments that you, you know, groceries, school fees, all, the, all, all those payments that you would need to carry on um, and paying, you know, uh, uh, along with, with your home loan payment. 
The only payments that we don't take into account are like savings. So if you've got a, if you're putting, you know, 2,000 Rand aside every month towards a savings account, I mean, that you can stop any, any time. You know, no one's going to force you to keep that payment going. So we ignore those. Those are discretionary. Um, that kind of payment is discretionary. But uh, otherwise, we really want to ensure, we really want to have a good, a, good, a good view as to what your disposable income is. And then that disposable income is what we apply towards the home loan payments. So how much can you afford? What does that look like? So as a very, as a number one, as a rule of thumb, we look at repayment to income. So if you take your average monthly income, we would take 30% of that gross income. So pre-tax, so if, if you're earning 30,000 a month uh, pre-tax, then 30% of that is roughly, it's about, about not quite 10, it's about 9,000. And that 9,000 is effectively what you can afford for a home loan payment. Okay, that's that that's a rule of thumb. But like I said, on the right hand side, essentially it's income less expenses. That that tells you what's available from a lending perspective. Um, so if you go onto a lot of the bank bank sites and originators, mortgage originators, um, they all have calculators, uh, and you can go and play there and, and kind of get a sense for what um, for what you you can afford. Cool. Okay. Credit Bureau. So, so, so the bank looks at the bank really looks at three things. One is affordability. One is your credit. The third, second one is your credit score, and the last one is is um, the 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 houses, the properties valuation, and which which we'll come to just now. So in terms of your credit score, um, there are there are two large credit bureaus that we look at: TransUnion and Experian. Um, one we don't look at, which which is the TPN Credit Bureau. I'll tell you about that in a second. And really what TransUnion and Experian and, and a couple of others that, what they do is they pull your payment behavior um, from the likes of Vodacom, Edgar's, um, you know, any, anywhere where you have a, 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 a contracted loan and, and you're having mm -hmm. to pay someone off. Even nowadays, this is where TPN comes in. TPN is a credit bureau for people paying their rents as well as um, parents paying school fees. And, and so wherever you have a contract uh, commitment to um, the, that payment behavior gets uploaded to one of these credit bureaus. And what they do with that is that based on that, they, they pull a score together. Um, it's called the Delphi score, and various different scores. They just say, this person pays their debts well, or, you know, this person is, is, is over-debted. They might be paying well, but they're a little bit more over-debted than they should be. But it really does come down to payment behavior. And the banks will pull information from, from the likes of TransUnion and Experian. And then the, uh, the banks will, will create their own credit profiles. We've got, we've got very clever guys with propeller heads uh, in, in the back. And, and they really do pull, um, um, they, they pull the external information together. Of course, we have clients who are paying us you know, for personal loans and credit cards, etc., we match that and, and we and we create our own credit scores. And based on this, when you come for a loan, uh, this is this is the second thing we look at very quickly: is is what is your credit score? What's been your payment behavior? Now, if you've missed one or two payments, that's not the end of the world. It's just your, that your credit score drops a bit, um, mm -hmm. and uh, you, so you're you, you're categorized, categorized as a slightly higher risk. Uh, and, and, and the bank may require that you put in a bit of a deposit and, and your, 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 your interest rate might, might go up because of it. You know? So it's not that banks say no, unless the, that they consider the behavior as such that you know, it's, it's not mm. someone that, that, that they would have to take a risk on. Um, so, you know, the, so this credit bureau, it's always considered to be something that's like out there and we don't quite know what, I, so what, what's, what's my score? And, and, and what can I do about it? So each one of these, legally, you can go to TransUnion, you can pull a report on yourself once a year for free. They will have to give you a report. Them, them Experian, TPN, et cetera. And, you know, you just go into their website, so you find the right page, you might have to register. And in doing so, it's such, you'll be amazed at how much information is, is collected about you. 
Um, and it's, it's, it's really something, it's, it's really interesting exercise to do. And it really does create that awareness that you really got to look after your, your, your credit score. Um, if, if, if there's one thing maybe walk away with today is, is you know, protect your credit score. Uh, it's, it's extremely, it's extremely valuable. There is a nice app that you can use. And I actually, I, I've got this app. It's called Clear Score. Um, I'm on I'm on Android, so I downloaded it off the Play Store. But I think, um, you know, uh, um, Apple, uh, the, uh, the iStore will have the same. And this is, this I, I, I go to once a month. It, it, it updates. And, and this will, Effectively, I'm not sure which which bureau it, it connects to, but it, it, give, it keeps track of my score. And and the reason I do this, um, you know, other than just generally keeping track, is to make sure actually that I haven't been, um, I haven't no no one's stolen my identity and it's using my 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 identity to to go go to go to go and get credits out there. So so I, I do keep track of this um, as a as a property investor. My credit score is very important to me. I can't invest, I can't finance without a good credit score. So I do keep track of it, um, but it's, it's a great way also just to you know, check for identity theft, to, to be honest. Um, and it's a free app, anyone, anyone can pull. Now here, for example, 681 out of 700. Now this is there, this is clear score, scores, credit score. APSA, Standard Bank, FNB, NetBank, they will have different numbers. Um, so for example, APSA has a ranking out of 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 9, 10. Not, not the 681 out of 700. But it's, you know, but it, it, it will broadly uh, come, come to the same thing. 681, I think, is a very good score. Um, so this will be like a one, a one in our space, um, which, which, which is the best score you can get. Um, and it drops down quite, quick, quite quite quickly at about 600, 620, you're probably sitting at six or seven, maybe eight. So it, it really just is a nice way of just keeping track of your credit score. Um, and as I said, you know, um, even um, identity theft. Then the property valuation. So, so now we have checked that you can afford it. You can afford the loan that you're requesting that, um, you have the affordable, uh, so you can afford it, that you have demonstrated that uh, over multiple um, institutions, you you can keep up with your commitments to pay your loans, you know, whether it's your your uh, gym, your school fees, or your standard bank, or your, um, your standard bank personal loan. That, that all comes together. So it's, it's a tick tick. The last thing is in property valuation. So if you're going for an application uh, for a home loan, they will give you, they'll come, will, the banks will come, usually come back to you pretty quick uh, within two or three days with a grant in principle. And the reason why they say in principle, because it's subject to a property valuation. They may either send someone out to have a look at the property or they might do a, a what they call a desktop valuation where they look at uh, properties in the, in the area, they, they, they put a deed office report, etc. And what they really want to know is that if you want to, buy this 1 million rand home, is the property actually worth 1 million? Because at the end of the day, if things don't work out and you aren't able to make your payments, in the worst case scenario, that property is there to settle your loan with the bank. So, so very critical for the bank to secure their, um, their, their loan, but also even for yourself, that should things not work out, so should there be a problem whatever reason you want to be able to say okay let me let me sell my property um let me and, and hopefully the, the price that you get should be able to settle settle your loan what the bank will often do with a with, with the property values is, is what they call loan to value they might say look we're only willing to give you 90 percent which means you've got to put our tent down a 10 percent deposit and they won't always necessarily give you a hundred percent loan which I think as, um, as self-employed individuals yourselves, Jared and, and, and Tabaleng, you know, you, you probably will find yourself in that in that situation um, where where the bank will will, will will be happy to give you up, up to 90%. Now, there's a good and a bad there. Yeah, so you know, you've got to come up with a 10% deposit. If you're buying a million rand home, you're going to now come up with 100,000 rand. You know, that's, that's actually a challenge in itself. But 90% LTV reduces the price so at 100 percent where you might have paid prime plus half 
now you might pay prime because you're at 90%, even maybe in prime minus 0.1. Uh, so, so there's definitely a benefit in terms of price um, when it comes to, to putting a deposit down. So it's not all bad. It's tough saving up for a deposit, but you definitely do get the benefits in price. And of course, that price is what you're going to pay over 20 years. So, 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 so definitely do, do, do think about it like that. Some great learnings that we've had this week. And we thank our guests for their valuable insights. That is so critical when you want to purchase your first property. For more information about this and our 50-day challenge, go to our website, www.edpfpropertyacademy.com and follow this incredible journey of the 50-day property challenge that we are embarking on with our celebrity guests, Matt Owl and Jared Ricketts. Every day, you can listen in on what we learned that day, follow their journey, and hopefully you too can start your own property portfolio. This is Nigel Adrianza signing off for the EDPF Property Academy and the 50-Day Property Challenge. See you again on Monday.